Welcome back to the channel. My name is Andy Nguyen and I'm basically just a camera nerd. I shoot on Sony's and I shoot on Panasonic's. Today I'm going to be comparing the two first lenses that people are considering when they get a Panasonic GH5. The Sigma 18-35 f1.8 with the Metabones Speed Booster Ultra and going with the tried and true. This is the Panasonic 12-35 native lens, f2.8. Both of these lenses are more or less a standard zoom. The Panasonic lens has a 24-70 to 70 equivalent focal range and with the Sigma 18-35 on a crop with the speed booster, it's around 25 to 50 millimeters. For all intents and purposes, they do the same job. For those of you who don't have a lot of time with me here today, I'm gonna to summarize it with the Sigma 18-35 f1.8 is the low light monster. It does not have stabilization and is recommended to be used with a heavy duty gimbal like the Ronin S or the Zhiyun Crane 2 or on tripod because of the lack of stabilization. It is not much of a run and gun lens if you're traveling and you wanna do all that. I would definitely recommend the Panasonic for that. The Panasonic 12-35 over here has stabilization in the lens which works in conjunction with the stabilization in the body so you get dual image stabilization that allows you to walk with the camera and it will look gimbal like this is not possible with the Sigma 18 and 35 the main difference between the two is this can go to f1.1 with the speed booster and this only goes to f2.8 so if you're going to carry the 12 to 35 you will need a prime lens or some kind of light to supplement when it gets dark but let's get into the comparison so we'll start talking about the pros for the Sigma 18 and 35 the Panasonic series as you know are micro four thirds cameras as of right now they are releasing a full frame system soon soon ish the sigma 1835 f1.8 allows the panasonic user to get closer to the full frame look this is due to the speed booster the speed booster is a focal reducer and it also increases the aperture size for argument's sake you multiply the aperture by 0.71 and the focal length by 0.71 the prime lenses on the micro four thirds system go to 1.7 this lens right here goes to 1.2. This is very beneficial in the low light situations. You can get a little bit more light into the camera, allowing you to use it in more situations. This is a lens I only recommend when weight isn't an issue. It is a crop lens from Sigma. It is not designed for micro four thirds. So because of that, it is very heavy. If I were to use it on a smaller camera like the G85, it's very front heavy, hard to use. Because I use it on GH5, which although it's a micro four thirds body, it's essentially a DSLR body. Weight, size, and all. With the Sigma 18 and 35 on it, it's a little heavy, but it's a little bit more balanced due to the heavier body. To explain why I love this lens, the Speed Booster focuses the crop image down to the Micro Four Thirds sensor, creating a very sharp image. The GH5 already has really good 1080p sharpness, and with 4K and the Sigma 18 and 35 scaled down to 1080p, the sharpness is crazy. When I show people the video I shoot on the GH5 with the Sigma 18 and 35, they cannot believe it. It looks amazing. One of the things I don't like about it is that there's a short range. So you really have to get close to your subject. You can't just sit in the back and zoom and punch in. That's not enough. With 50 millimeters equivalent, you can't get close unless you zoom with your feet. And on top of that, this lens is not a great travel lens. As you can see, it is a big boy. I will be traveling to New York with this lens because my Sony is in the repair yeah, shop, but I've shot long days with this shooting weddings and boy, it hurts your shoulders. And the other thing about this lens is that Panasonic GH5 is already not known for its autofocus. So when you have an adapted lens with a Metabone Speed Booster, it is even worse. The autofocus is loud, clunky. You may have seen it in one of my podcast videos where the autofocus just lost it and it went back and forward. The Panasonic GH5 series is not known for the autofocus. So you really wanna give it the best chance you can give it. When you use an adapted lens with a Metabone Speed Booster, it's not even native. The autofocus, if you leave it an autofocus continuous, is gonna ratchet and it will go forward and back because of the contrast attack and it just is not reliable for autofocus. You can however use it on manual focus and then press the AF button to just do a quick focus and you're essentially just using a one shot focus and then you can use manual focus from there. But I will say using the manual focus ring on this is a dream. The manual focus ring is mechanical so it is easily repeatable. The throw is pretty short so you, you have to get used to that. When I mean throw, I mean like when you rotate it, you can pretty much go all the way to infinity and back without making a full circle. So you have to be very careful, but it is very satisfying to use. Yeah. A benefit of using the Sigma 18 to 35 is the weight. Although I did say it was a drawback. When you have a heavier camera, 
it's easier to stay stable. It doesn't jerk around as much. When I started shooting video, I used the G Panasonic G7, very light plasticky body and using the light Micro Four Thirds lenses, everything was very shaky. I was using the GH5 and the Sigma 1835 handheld with the in-body image stabilization of the GH5. It is really smooth. As long as you do keep the camera close to your body and all the other stabilization techniques, it works really well because of the great in-body image stabilization of the GH5. And if you are a Sony user, I gotta tell you, the stabilization in-body for the GH5 is leaps and bounds ahead of the Sony's. This is due to the smaller sensor, it has more room to move. When you have a full frame sensor in the body, there's not much room for it to move, so that's why the Micro Four Thirds systems like the Panasonic and the Olympus tend to have better IBIS. Another drawback of this is that it needs an adapter. So you have to buy something else. This Metabone Speed Booster cost me 500 buckaroos. Back then the Viltrox EF M2 did not exist. So my only option was this. And although it works well, it is very overpriced. Metabones had a monopoly on the market so they could charge whatever they wanted. And this whole combination with the camera is not weather sealed. There's too many pieces, They're not, they don't all have the rubber gasket so I would not take it out in rain. And another thing I notice is when I attach this to the camera, here's the beautiful glass. You hear that? You can see it, right? That is play between the adapter and the camera. I do not feel safe using this all the time, especially since the, the lens is front heavy it's gonna keep applying pressure to the lens mount. That is scary. I've read accounts that people using the Viltrox adapter also experience the same thing. So in terms of long-term security, I've been using this for six months and there have been no issues, but I don't know, you know? Anything can happen. I don't know if this combination can take as many bumps or definitely not a drop because of this adapter and it created a weak point, you know? To remedy this situation, you can use a cage. So the cage will go around the camera. I'll show you in a second. This right here is a small rig cage for the GH5. And I also bought an adapter for the Metabone Speed Booster. I'll be screwing on this adapter now. All right, so it's all attached. So essentially, instead of having the lens hang off of the Speed Booster, and the speed booster hanging off of the camera body, the camera body now has a point of connection to the cage, and the cage is attached to the speed booster. So there's two points of connection. The speed booster is attached to the camera body, as well as the cage, which is also attached to the camera body. Now, there is still a little play between the lens and the adapter, but that will happen in any situation if you twist hard enough. But if you just if you don't twist and you just push, there is no play between the speed booster and the GH5 body. This does add weight, but it also adds a point to hold for more stability. My most stable shots have been from this combination. You could get more stable with a shoulder rig and all that, but this still feels a little bit more run and gun than having it on a gimbal or anything like that. One of the problems, if you have a lot of lenses, is that I had to use a hex key to attach the speed booster to the cage. The adapter is always attached to the cage. If I wanted to use the cage without the speed booster and the Sigma 18 and 35, I'd have two separate hex keys to take it all apart. That is not fun. I typically only use the GH5 with the cage with the Sigma 18 and 35, because all the weight kind of like works together. If I don't want to use the Sigma 18 and 35 and I want to use the Panasonic 12 to 35, I will take it out of the cage and then I will just kind of run and gun with just camera body and lens. That's it. So we talked enough about the Sigma 18 to 35. Great lens, right? Sharp, lets in a lot more light, heavy, <laughs> and requires an adapter that you have to work around. But what if you want to go native? Native? is typically better for any camera system. If you get Sony lenses, you can adapt to Canon glass to it, but you typically want to use the native glass. You'll get better autofocus performance, typically better colors. Sigma is an exception. Sigma makes great glass. So, 12-35. This lens has dual image stabilization. I love the stabilization in this lens. 
It provides an extra oomph if you're vlogging because you're holding it out and you have the stabilization that's very similar to a gimbal without having to carry a big ass gimbal around. I hate traveling with a gimbal. The autofocus is manageable. People really complain about the autofocus because you're, they're comparing it to the Canon Dual Pixel AF or the Sony's AF system, but I've been using autofocus for this video. I really hope I don't forget saying that because this is the G85 recording. The G85 does not have as great autofocus as the GH5 and I'm letting it just run with autofocus for this video. But this lens has dual image stabilization so you don't have to use a gimbal. It has the autofocus because it's native glass. It doesn't do the autofocus because it is native glass and there's no adapter. It doesn't have to go through anything. The camera just talks to the lens. It is extremely light. This lens is so light. I can hold it with two fingers. It is a 2.8 lens, whereas the Sigma 18-35 is 1.2. This, without the speed booster cheating, without well, kind of cheating with the speed booster, compare this to like a full frame 2.8 lens. This is tiny. Look at this. It's so tiny. Tiny. Especially when using it in public, it is less conspicuous. Give me a second to take apart the Sigma 18-35. This whole thing so I can show you how it looks on the camera. That's why I typically reserve the Sigma 18-35 for professional work. And if I'm just kind of vlogging or having fun, I'll, I, I work around the Panasonic 12-35. I don't need 1.2 all the time. I'm not a vocalicious fiend like some people out there. For video, you typically want more in focus anyway. Oh, I have a magnetic filter on so it drops. All right, we are back, ladies and gentlemen. This is the GH5 with the 12-35 f2.8. This is the Mark I lens, I, I forgot to mention. In some cases, it's actually sharper than the Mark II, so if you try to save some money, get the Mark I. This is... It's hard to say. This is light when compared to the Sigma 18 and 35 or the full frame offerings of Sony or Canon. But in terms of Micro Four Thirds, this is a pretty heavy setup due to the GH5's girth but this is very vloggable with the mic it t sometimes gets a little heavy but you can vlog with this it is definitely overkill i do not recommend vlogging with a two thousand dollar camera it's totally not necessary it's more about the story you tell and how you connect with your viewers you don't need crazy equipment but this is the only camera you have it is a great option so if you're just going around in public taking pictures or doing video this camera is very inconspicuous. No one's gonna look at you funny. You're not gonna get called out by security. Though, don't worry about it. You'll be fine with this camera. If you have this, however, yeah, yeah, yeah. That's not gonna happen. You're gonna get called out. This combination also has weather sealing. Panasonic 12-35 is weather sealed, so is the body. I took this to Iceland. Rain, snow, ice, wind. Set it down in water. I didn't set it down in water. Don't do that. I went through the entire trip with just GH5 and this lens no water damage whatsoever nothing funky happened it was great if i brought this out i did have this with me but i did not want to bring it out it was raining the entire time in iceland if you're going to go to a rainy area you need something weather sealed so this is the better option for that there's no adapter required nothing to fiddle around with you can use this just press the button take it off switch to another lens no problem compared to the optimal setup with the sigma 18 to 35 with the cage and then the adapter and the little screws and the hex keys it is Thoroughly annoying to have to deal with that, especially if you're doing something for fun. Going out with friends or going to travel is a bit of a hassle. That's why I do recommend just using this for professional work. For a wedding, it's worth it. You want the low light, you want the bokeh, you really want the ultimate sharpness because someone's paying you to capture their day. Why would you take shortcuts? But for personal stuff, I can use this for a wedding too. I have used this for a wedding. It's not just for personal stuff. Or I use the 12 to 35 f2.8 when there's ample light. Even when the sun's setting, I can still crank up the ISO to about 3200 before I start seeing green. And if I have to push further, no, no problem, just use neat video. But on that note, if it is my one lens and I'm traveling around with it, because the GH5's Micro Four Thirds sensor cannot handle crazy ISOs, it's not the GH5S, the S is the one with the crazy low light. I do need another lens when I'm traveling during nighttime. There is a meme going around where Sony fanboys, they love going out at night shooting. Panasonic fanboys always talk about lighting and they only hang out during the day. It's all a joke, it's all memed up. I've used this at night, 
I just am very careful with how I light my subjects. I'll move my subject to a light source so that I get a better exposure and a better frame. To be honest, if you're shooting at like 12,000 ISO, you typically don't have an interesting frame. You're in a dark corner somewhere with no light. I'm sure the Sony fanboys are gonna hate me for saying that, but they're not many situations where I wish I had 6400 ISO or higher to get the shot that I wanted. Of course, when you're going out to shoot like a night event or a concert or something like that, like a night parade, yes, you will need more ISO, but 80% of the time, okay, maybe 75% of the time, I'm fine with f2.8 and at most 3200 ISO. Maybe that's just me. Maybe I'm an old man and don't like to go out at night. Who knows? Another thing about this lens, the manual focus ring sucks. I've also dropped this camera and lens, so I'm not really sure if that had anything to do with it. But when compared to the Mark II version of the 12 to 35, this manual focus ring is not smooth. It's kind of scratchy, and that sucks because when you're using variable frame rate for the with the GH5, you need variable frame rate to use the 96 FPS or like 180 FPS or 120 FPS, and they don't have autofocus in those modes, so you have to manual focus. They don't have the autofocus where you just press the focus either. Autofocus is completely turned off and the lens like many other mirrorless systems is fly-by-wire I believe. The one where the focus depends on how fast you focus it rather than the distance so you can't repeat focus moves. It, it's really a hassle combined with like the scratchiness. I rarely use the manual focus ring on this even though I have to sometimes. The autofocus is reliable enough for me to use for personal stuff. For professional work I'm more likely than not using manual focus. It's a little bit of an elitist attitude, but manual focus is reliable, it will not fail you, nothing can walk through the shot or get, nothing can trick the camera. So, the bokeh. Uh, in my last video when I mentioned bokeh, people lost their minds. Everyone was discussing about it. So like when I said this lens is f1.2, f1.2 in micro four thirds terms. For full frame equivalent, the bokeh is gonna be equivalent to f2.4. That's just the way it is. I really can't get f1.2 full frame equivalent on the Micro Four Thirds system. The lowest aperture is the Notochron lenses, 0.95. 0.95 on Micro Four Thirds, which is really 1.8 on full frame. So I can't really get any lower than that. That's just the way it is. So this lens, being f2.8, it's equivalent in bokeh to f5.6 on full frame. It does take getting used to. The meme of vloggers is they like to use their wide prime lenses at, at like f1.4 on crop or f1.8 on full frame or just blow out the background. And it looks cool, it looks cinematic, but for me, when I when I try to vlog or when I do some of my personal videos, the context of where I am is very important to me. So I don't miss the bokeh as much as I thought it would. And you can get native lenses if you don't want to carry this bad boy around. You can get native Panasonic or Olympus glass that is f1.7 or f1.8 and there are some micro four thirds mounts that are 0.95 like I mentioned the notochrons but it does take getting used to when I try to maximize my bokeh I'll go into 35 millimeters which is 70 millimeters it's the same aperture across the entire focal length I do 75 millimeters at f2.8 which is like 5.6 on a full frame and I get some nice blur that way but it's not the same as full frame I will not get full frame background blur that's just the way it is and I'm okay with it you go, you go into the Micro Four Thirds system knowing that's the physical limitations of the sensor and you just work around it. If you really want that bokeh, you can actually add another Micro Four Thirds lens to your bag like the 42.5 f1.7 or even crazier, the 75mm f1.8 by Olympus and you can get crazy background blur and the lens is like this big. So you can get your background blur when you need it but for most of my stuff, I use this. The, basically the 2470 f2.8 or 2470 f5.6 if you're really comparing the bokeh uh, lens. And to answer the question of those who were talking with me before, f2.8 lets in the same amount of light on micro four thirds as it does on full frame for the size. The exposure, if I were to set a micro four thirds camera and a full frame camera side by side, and I set them to the same ISO shutter speed aperture, in the same environment point at the same thing, the aperture will be the same between both cameras. Full frame benefit is that you can push the ISO further and you get more background blur. There's like a mathematical explanation for the background blur, but it has to do with like the 2x. I'll link to a very good video by some people smarter than I or better than, at explaining than I am, so you can learn on your own. But that is it. The comparison between these two 
lenses. All right, sorry for the outfit change. I had to re-record because when editing, I realized I got all the prices wrong on the gear. So let's talk prices, shall we? This is the Sigma 18 and 35. I originally said it was around 600 bucks or so. It is actually 799 for BH Photo Video, and at the time of recording, there is a lower price on Amazon at 729. Sometimes it goes on sale for around 700 bucks. It includes the Sigma dock. dock, so you can fix the focus or whatever. I've never used it. $800 new, essentially, and on the used market, it'll run around 600. It's really easy to find us on the used market because it is a very good crop lens. People use it for the Sony, Sony crop cameras. People use it for the Canon crop cameras or even on the cinema camera lines for the manufacturers. And the Metabone Speed Booster is really freaking expensive. It, it, this right here, this little thing right here, runs $649. The alternative that didn't exist when I bought it is a third party, they're all third party, but a third party adapter manufacturer. It's also a speed booster. It's still 0.71 applied to the aperture and the focal length. It is the Viltrox EF-M2 that I mentioned before, and it runs $121.99 from China. If you buy on Amazon, due to the supply things, you get it faster because it's gonna come from an Amazon warehouse, but they're gonna run you like 200 plus. So if you can wait a few weeks for a shipment from China, I'll link it below, but a seller named TomTop, kinda of sketchy site, but that's where I've read people are getting their Viltrox EF-M2s. The performance is very similar to the Metabone Speed Booster, a little bit more issues than the Metabones, but at like one fourth the price, it's well worth the savings. You can get two, three, four of them for the price of one Metabone Speed Booster. And back to the rest of the video where I'm wearing a different shirt. I bought this lens used. There's a lot of them on the market. It's a very popular lens because even people using cinema cameras use it. It is an extremely sharp lens. And if you have another body like a Sony a6300, you can get an adapter for that and still use this lens. It's great. If you have a Canon body, my girlfriend has a Canon 70D. She loves stealing the lens from me. It works for both of us and I can never use it when I want to, but that's something else. And this is the Panasonic 12 35. The price is around $500 used. Uh, if you want to buy the new Mark II, it's $1,000. I won't, I would not recommend that one. It's the same. It has dual IS2, which is like half a stop, or maybe one stop more stabilization compared to the dual IS1 of the Mark 1. But for like double the price, it's not really worth it. Get this one. I know this is purple. The Mark 2 is black. If you really need black, you gotta shell out the thousand dollars. You may be able to get it used for 800 or so. There's not a lot of demand for micro four thirds lenses, so you may get lucky. But which would I recommend between these two? This is for professional work or really creative work where you're gonna sit down and kind of control the environment and really put an honest effort into making a great film. Because of the weight and everything that I need to like make it work properly, that's what I recommend this for. So this I recommend for the wedding shooter. I recommend for the cinematics, like storyteller, narrative film. I wouldn't really recommend it for documentaries unless you're really hurting for light all the time. You need this for the low light shooter though. If your environment is low light, like you shoot music events or clubs, then yes, you do need the Sigma 18 and 35. Luckily, because it's a third party lens manufacturer, it's not too expensive, but most people I will recommend the Panasonic 12 to 35. You may disagree with me because it is not maximizing the bokeh you can get, but the versatility is unmatched. You go from 24 to 70 equivalent focal length, you get your stabilization, you get a small size, which is what people go into the Micro Four Thirds system for, and you're inconspicuous. It's, it's a lot to trade off for a little bit more light and some background blur. I definitely recommend this one to start out. I own both, I own both because this is my vlog lens and, and camera setup or quick videos with autofocus. If I weren't using the G85 with the 7 14 lens to record this, I'd be using the 12 35. It is very reliable. I know I won't blow out the wall like I would with the Sony camera on the 55 1.8, but I don't need that. It's nice for certain applications, but I don't need it all the time. And this one for weddings, of course, it looks beautiful. It's sharp. The colors are great. The background blur is great. It's just heavy as hell and with the cage i i don't want to carry all this with the camera on vacation unless i have to i'm doing some professional work when i'm going to my trip up to new york so i need to bring both of these i need to bring this for the vlog and stuff and i need to bring this with me 
but hope you enjoyed the video. I've been a Panasonic shooter for six months, six, eight months. I haven't used Panasonic GH4s or GH3s or anything like that. Well, that's it. That's the comparison. 1835 for the professional work. This for the casual stuff or just more versatile. You make your pick. The Sigma is more expensive, mostly due to the speed booster. Hope you learned something. If you disagree with anything I said, feel free to comment. I always respond. Uh, let's have a discussion in the bottom comment section about cameras because I love doing all that stuff. Uh, please like if you enjoyed this video. Subscribe if you wanna see more content like this. And I'll see you next time. Yeah, I don't know why I did that. Yeah, thanks. <laughs>